The next Action Hub event will be starting in five minutes. Please make your way to your seats. We would like to remind you not to move furniture and respect social distancing at all times. The next Action Hub event will be starting in one minute. Please take your seat and switch your phone to silent. If you don't have a seat, we invite you to watch the event online on the UNFCCC website or on the COP platform, but please do not stand on the side of the Action Hub.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Get On Board. We're here today going to be talking to you all about um, how the urgent need to shift towards rail and public transport uh, for climate uh, crisis mitigation. Um, and uh, I think uh, I'm just, just to let you know that we're hosted here um, by the UIC and UITP that are holding this event together. My name is Lucy Anderton. I'm the uh, lead on sustainability agenda at the UIC, which is the International Union of Railways. Um, and together with UITP, who are the International Union of Public Transport, and we work together really closely on this agenda and bring uh, two really interesting speakers uh, today, both from perspective of the Global South and the Global North. Um, and two different perspectives from passenger and urban planning and from freight and how we move our goods and logistics. Now, I think um, I probably don't need to tell many of you that uh, if you've been to any of the transport thematic events this week and last week, that transport is about a quarter of the global greenhouse gas emissions on this planet. So it's, not, it's a really massive issue. It's the second most largest uh, emitting sector on the world, in the world. So it's, it's an important thing, and it's, and, and it's something that's still growing. The emissions from transport is still growing consistently, um, and transport demand is still expected to be, demand, to be growing by about 50% um, in the same time that we need to actually totally decarbonize. So in this time, we really need to transform the way that we move uh, around the world. Um, so um, if, if we... Um, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker now. If I can welcome on the, on the stage our first speaker. Um, oh, where's my clicker? No clicker. Um, if we click on one slide then. Thank you. Okay, Juan Carlos Munoz, please welcome to the stage. Juan Carlos is director for the Center of Sustainable Urban Development and the Institute of Sustainable Development. Welcome, Juan Carlos. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So, um, I just wanted to, we're, we're talking today about 2030 and how important it is to transform the way that we move in the next decade. Yeah. We haven't got time. For, uh, to wait till 2050 and some of the innovations that are a bit further way off. So how do we really transform the way that we move, how way we move people, particularly in cities, um, in the next decade? What's your vision for 2030 and, how, and public transport? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question and the opportunity to be here. I would like to focus my, uh, my answer on the question on urban transport, especially since Geert will talk about freight right after me. Um, I think that in, in decarbonizing urban transport, we are heavily missing the point. Um, we are missing the opportunity that climate, ac climate action momentum brings to make our cities not only to emit less CO2, but also to be more fair, more cohesive, more healthy, less congested, provide a better quality of life. And all this relates directly to almost every other sustainable development goal other than SDG 13. Now, by placing our effort, our energy, and hope in electric vehicles only, I think nothing of this will happen. Our cities will not be more fair, more cohesive, more healthy, less congested, and providing a better quality of life if we only focus in, it, in electric vehicles. Now, uh, I think that if we are going to promote um, electric vehicles, we should promote them in, in public transport first, because that relates better to other sustainable development goals. Now, I would say that we need infrastructure, but we need the right one. And that is the one that makes cities more lively, that makes sustainable transport mode as bikes, walking, and public transport more effective. Infrastructure that allows citizens to meet in pleasant and vibrant places. We don't need infrastructure that makes car a more convenient choice. And I think that the elephant in the room here is the element that no one seems to talk about but which defines the, sustain the sustainability of a city is how its different activities are organized across a city, across the territory. I think we should request our future authorities that the average trip length in a city becomes shorter during their period. 
Imagine you were to request a new metropolitan authorities. You receive a city in which the average trip is 7.5 kilometers long. Your target is to reduce that figure by 10%. Shorter trips not only require less energy, they pollute less, they create less congestion. Short trips are much more likely to be walked or biked. And if trips suddenly become shorter, you will see that your crowded public transport system suddenly becomes less so and also becomes more efficient. When we address our urban mobility issues, we focus immediately in the transport system. I think that for many very large cities, this is a mistake. We should focus first on trying to bring the city closer to its residents by providing incentives that bring the city Sorry, and this is why I love the provocative 15-minute city that Major Anne Hidalgo wants for her city of Paris. So this is the proposal today, is if you want to make your city have a better public transport system, if you want to have a more effective transport system, don't focus on the transport. Focus on how the city is organized. Mm. And, and you've worked in Rapid Bus and you've been board member of Metro in Santiago de Chile, right? So you must know a few things about the difficulties of public transport operations. So what are the kind of things that are holding public transport back? What can we really get to accelerate more people getting onto public transport? I think, I think we should stop trying to fix in some way the unsustainable city we see and focus instead on the sustainable city that needs to flourish. And I think that's, that's a problem. We're always asking public transport to fix the problems we're seeing and not to drive the city we want to see. So if we see people traveling 20 kilometers to reach their jobs, I don't think that we should provide a fast metro that could help them arrive there faster. What this will trigger is that people will start living even further. And that's what happened in my city. You provide a great metro and people will start living even further. And we'll make, and so you're feeding the kind of loop that you don't want to feed. So what if instead we provide incentives to relocate some of the opportunities closer to where people live? So take your $1.6 billion metro and maybe put it in putting incentives to bring people closer to where they work. I think we should give authorities the right challenges, not just reduce the emissions. What if we ask them to reduce trip length? I think we should ask them to monitor the accessibility that the city brings to low-income residents in work opportunities, study, recreation, and in green areas. Now, if we focus in the transportation system, I think one of the main issues we should tackle is fare integration. Too many first world cities are struggling on such a basic issue. Glasgow is struggling on this. They don't have fare integration. You have to pay every single ticket different. Of course, we cop people don't. <laughs> and I think we should be taking infrastructure from cars and put them in the modes we want to watch. So take some infrastructure from the cars Finally, and this will end my presentation, I think that cities must look very carefully at how new technologies will affect urban mobility. Now we're looking, listening a lot about automated vehicles, for instance. I think that if mishandled, automated vehicles can be the perfect nightmare for cities. Imagine all these empty vehicles without a driver moving around just to be waiting for be, to be parked or to pick up someone. So if mishandled, I think this can be a really nightmare, as I said. I think cities should instead embrace this technology on buses first. Imagine that your buses can go, which go always in a, in a, given, in a given corridor, and they can be always on time, always with the right headway, always with a very smooth drive. I think the automation, for instance, is something I would like to see on public transport first, as we see it in Metro that will make them more efficient, less pollutant, more reliable, safer, and smoother. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. I totally agree, that investment in public transport, because if we've got, if we just replace uh, cars we have now for electric cars, and that's all we do, then we still have congested roads, right. we have busy cities, we don't have, and think of if we can free up that space in our cities, much more livable, pleasant places to be, so. So thank you. For your, for, if you want to take a seat, and um, I, if I we will. have time, we'll bring you back on. Thank back you very much questions. for this invitation. Thank you. OK, I'm going to uh, shortly uh, welcome our second speaker now, uh, Gert Powers. Um, and he's the CEO of uh, Linius, which is the um, largest uh, private rail freight uh, company within Europe. 
and as co-founder of the European Rail Freight Forward Coalition. And a few years ago, um, Gertz, along with a few other CEOs, um, was worked together, uh, rallied the group together to start thinking about how they can really um, boost the shift to rail uh, for the freight organizations. And so they've pulled this uh, coalition together. And so he speaks very much as a founding member of the Rail Freight Forward Coalition. Um, and really here um, to talk about the plans, the ambitious plans of, of rail freight community within Europe. And we've first we've got a, a short video to tell you about it. Get pals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning, everyone. The greatest threat to our planet is a fact, or we're going to believe someone else is going to save it. This is very much true, isn't it? And I think that's also why we're here together in Glasgow these couple of weeks to make sure that we are going to do something about this. We're actually taking action and doing it ourselves. And that is, I think, where rail freight really has gold in its hands. Because we're already contributing at this point in time, and we've got very clear propositions to make that contribution a lot bigger. But I'm not sure if you, if many people are aware of this. So that's why I'm doing this presentation to show to you what we're going to be doing with rail freight to make a significant contribution to the planet. Let's have a look at how we do currently transport in Europe to have a start. This is actually my hometown in Antwerp, but I think everyone recognizes this, right? Traffic jams on the ring, and then next to it, just one train running. Still ample capacity for additional trains. But we're all stuck in traffic, and we're emitting CO2s all over the place. If we, it's not just in Antwerp, it's about all over the place in Europe. But if we come to the conclusion by looking at this, I mean, basically, the transport system in Europe is at this point in time just not sustainable. And how come? Well, basically, 75% of all freight transport is done by trucks. And because of that, 10% of all CO2 emissions in Europe are actually generated by freight transport. And not only that, also, we spend a lot of time in traffic jams, and there's lots of air pollution. This is not sustainable. But the real problem is actually is going to get a lot worse. In the next 10 years, we actually expect about 30% increase of freight traffic. And if we don't do anything about that, well, what, what, is, what, what, would, it mean, what would it mean? 
basically, we're just going to have more CO2 emissions rather than less. And we're all going to get fully stuck in traffic. Now, is that what we want? Of course not. But we need to do something about this. Well, and luckily, there's a lot of innovation going on in road transport. There are things happening. They're making it greener, they're making it more efficient, and so on. But will that be sufficient? Will it be soon enough? Also, will that save mobility or solve mobility issues and energy issues? Mm. What we believe is that the real solution, if you really want to reach our climate targets, and also if you want to solve the mobility problem in Europe, is to go for a radical modal shift from road to rail. Now, why do I say this? Well, because of this. We're nine times less CO2 emitted than road. Nine times less. We're not talking about minus 10%, minus 20%. We're talking about divided by nine. And we actually can make it carbon free. So this is the most environmentally good solution. Also, it's eight times less air pollution, six times more energy efficient. And of course, we can also take trucks out of road. Every time we have a train, we take about 50 trucks off the roads. So this is the solution. What are we waiting for? Well, that's also what we said. And we defined our ambition with the Rail Freight Forward Coalition of the rail freight companies to double the rail freight volumes by 2030. Now, this is indeed ambitious. But it's not just our ambition. Also, Europe is saying this. The governments, many stakeholders are saying this. We need to do something about this. Let's double the rail freight volumes by 2030. And let's drastically shift from road to rail. Now, what should we do then? Where do we want to go towards? Well, our vision is to build a high-performing multimodal transport system with rail as a backbone. That's the way it should be. For the big volumes, for the backbone, we use rail. Now, how do we get there? And that's the key point. Well, there's many people, many actors that need to contribute to that. First of all, us rail freight companies. Lineas is a rail freight company. What do we need to do? Well, we need to make sure that we put in place railway products that are so good that our customers, the big industrial companies like the Arcelors and the BSFs and so on, that they will say, why should I still transport my goods with a truck if I can also use rail? It should actually be better for their own supply chain. And by doing that, they then can contribute to climate and mobility. That's our first objective of rail freight companies. And we're working on that. We're modernizing our companies. We're making sure we're digitizing our companies. We're making sure that the products that we put into the market are really as good or better than trucks. That's what we need to do. Second, the infrastructure managers. We drive trains on the infrastructure. And that's not always so easy these days, or has never been. And so what do we want them to do? Well, like you see, we want them to continue to maintain the current infrastructure at a really good level, and also to further invest in those infrastructures and upgrade it so that we can drive long trains, broad trains, that we can do this in a fluent way. But not just, it's not just about the infrastructure. They should also take up a role. They should also take up a role of doing flow management. Basically, what we want them to do is make sure, or their mission should be, uh, making sure that driving a train through Europe becomes as easy as driving a truck through Europe. If they do that, well, we can then much easier do the modal shift. Now, even if rail freight companies and infrastructure managers work all together, well, we're going to get a long way, but we can't do it alone. We need also the help of the governments. And basically, we're asking for two things. The first one is this one. We want to make sure that governments put in place a level playing field in between the transport modes. Currently, there is a disadvantage for rail versus the other transport modes. We need to correct that. And we also need to take into account external costs. Now, how do we do that? Well, carbon pricing might be a system, but it's politically debatable. And, but, but I mean, we're, we're actually open for any system. But what we don't understand as rail sector is why is there an ETS system for all the other industries, whereas we with rail or with transport were not included? We, we are a big emitter of CO2. We should be included. So we propose to have the emission trading system for the freight transport or for the entire transport sector. And let's do that quickly. What are we waiting for? Let's put it in place and make it relevant so that we make the difference with this. The second thing that we're asking from our governments is to help us with innovation. We all know if we look at a freight train, 
sometimes it's a little bit embarrassing. If you look at a freight train running by, you actually, I mean, you could be looking at a freight train from 50 years ago or 100 years ago. It still looks the same, right? Well, it is also true. I mean, there's been some innovation, but we need to go way further than that. There's a lot more to do. And some companies are working on this very well, but we need to go a lot further. Also, not with individual companies only, but as a system. And we've been waiting for that too long. Well, now we've come together with the entire sector, the entire railway sector, and we have defined five technologies that will take rail freight into the next century. Because we actually have been the leaders of the first industrial revolution, but uh, we also want to take our fair share of the fourth industrial revolution. And we can do that if we really work together well as a railway system. Now, let me propose to you these five technologies. The first one I think is known by most people is uh, we want to make rail freight borderless by introducing and correctly deploying a European rail traffic management system. Uh, currently, there's lots of national infrastructure with each their own safety system. We want one safety system so that the train can run safely from one country to the other in the right way. We need to deploy this consequently, consistently, in a well-coordinated way and properly financed. The second technology is how do we make rail freight flexible? Well, we can introduce digital capacity management. What does it mean? Well, currently we have to ask rail paths to be able to drive a train on each of the various national infrastructure managers. And it's a lengthy, manual, cumbersome process. With digital capacity management, we'd be able to get a rail path on a click. And this would be so much more flexible for us. And actually for the infrastructure managers, it would allow them to further increase the utilization of their capacity. So it would be good for everyone. The third technology is in order to make rail freight seamless. We're exchanging lots of data between various stakeholders in various countries to be able to drive a train on wagons, on locomotives, on infrastructure. Well, we want to introduce one digital platform across Europe that we use to exchange data between all the stakeholders for driving trains in a smooth way. The fourth technology will make rail freight faster and more efficient. Currently, we're still coupling wagons in a manual way. It's pretty heavy labor. Our people are doing this, and we're proud of that. But we can do this easier and better and faster. And actually, in other continents, they do this with digital automatic coupling. This would be a game changer for Europe. And then the last technology, well, I think is also the last technology, is to go towards automatic train operations. So if we really want to see further into the future, that is where we want to end up, that trains run by themselves or even wagons could drive by themselves across Europe, like in a warehouse from one side to the other. I mean, that is our ultimate dream, and it is not so far reached. We're actually working on all of these five technologies currently already. So we're doing this. We have these five technologies, and this will really bring rail freight into the next century, and will make it much more performant than it currently is. So what are we waiting for? Well, with this, we are really building the backbone for Europe's transport. We're doing that. But now we need the funding. We need concrete decisions also by Europe. And we're telling Europe, hey, Europe, you want something green, resilient, innovative? Well, this is exactly that. With the propositions we have here, we're making Europe's transport green, resilient, and innovative. So let's fund it. Let's take the decision. It is time to act. Let's model shift together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you could mm. wait, wait Sorry, for yeah. me there. We've got a few more minutes. So if, if anyone has any questions, um, start thinking about that. There's a mic right on, the, on each side. If you want to make your way to the mic, um, then please come along and ask a question. Um, and if, if Juan Carlos, if I can welcome you, welcome you back onto the stage as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, my name is Bridget Smith. I'm from local government. Um, obviously, this is all the right thing to do, but we also have to consider the impact on jobs and the skills sector as well. So a lot of this innovation actually will result in job losses. So where do you anticipate those new green jobs coming from as you revolutionize uh, the, the rail system? Well, um, I believe in the UK, there's currently a shortage of truck drivers, right? Um, in Europe as well. 
And I think we're all suffering from that because we don't see the goods ending up in the warehouse or we don't see the gas stations being filled. I think at this point in time, um, we really lack jobs we, and we're recruiting heavily both in Europe, uh, on the continent and the UK. I think this will actually take a lot of people to make sure that we go through this transition. And because this is not for tomorrow, this is some of these things will actually yield something tomorrow, but this is actually a plan that we want to execute between now and 2030. And until then, we'll, we'll need a lot of jobs. And also, when we put this in place, there's still a lot of jobs needed to make that work. We're not ready yet for having a fully automated warehouse in Europe. Uh, we're taking steps towards that. And I think this is the right way to do. It will solve many issues. May, may I add something? Yeah, please do. I, I, I also think. Let me take this out. I, I also think that uh, congestion in cities and congestion all around uh, our roads is also a job killer because it makes all our systems less efficient. So I think that we should not uh, forget that by making our systems better, probably we'll, we'll allow the economy to blossom more. I mean, there's congestion in cities and congestion in all our, our transportation system. Uh, it's really, uh, it's a big break in the economy. So I think it's something also an effect that we should also consider. Yeah, thank you. And I think we have another question. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Ruth Cadbury, MP. I'm a member of the UK Parliament's Transport Committee and I'm also on Labour's front bench, uh, local government and communities team. Um, I think I've got two questions, if that's all right, but I think the first one is a short one for the second speaker. Thank you, that was inspiring. Um, uh, it, it, when you say Europe, <laughs> do you mean Europe in the EU, or do you mean Europe in the wider sense, and maybe including the UK? Um, and secondly, uh, you're, you know, we can't argue with the case you were making, but we need to remember what, think about what happens once, once those containers arrive at the city of their destination and how they get onwards, um, last mile uh, travel and, and so on, because uh, it, we've still got the issue, as the first speaker was saying, of congestion in our cities. Thank you. Well, maybe to your first question, um, we're not excluding any countries. I think it's about where, from where to where do we need to drive the cargo? And, and we should include as many uh, countries as possible. Uh, well, actually, we should, we should think about the whole system. Uh, so, of course, UK is in, but also, I mean, the, the many countries also in, in Eastern Europe and actually towards Russia, I mean, we should be working together as one full system. To your second question, same answer. It should be a full system. So I'm also pleading for a multimodal transport system with rail as a backbone. So to d deliver the last miles, we need to work together with the various other transport modes to be able to deliver fully. And the technologies that are foreseen, like for example, the digital platform also will make it easier not just to work seamlessly within the rail elements of the, of the value chain, but it will go end to end. We should work in a seamless way also with first and last miles. Okay. I'm afraid we've now, I can see by my big timer here that we've, we've now come to the end of our session. So thank you so much for a really inspiring vision for, for the next 10 years and how we really will transform the way that we travel. Um, so thank you very much, Gert and Juan Carlos. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you for attending. The event is now over. Please vacate the Action Hub so our team can clean the room.